Bankless Nation, I'm coming to you from Solana Breakpoint in Amsterdam. This is the third breakpoint that has ever happened in the year 2023, and this one is a little bit different. The, the first breakpoint happened in 2021 in uh, the second half of the year. Absolute peak froth of the bull market uh, in Lisbon, uh, followed by the se second Solana breakpoint in 2022, also in Lisbon, which happened right before the collapse of FTX. And here we are, uh, a new venue, new city, Amsterdam, uh, for Solana breakpoint number three. Uh, and this one has a little bit different of a vibe. This one is deep into the bear market, perhaps coming out of the bear market. And the Solana community has been cultivated as such, as you would imagine, the people that went to the 2021 Solana breakpoint when sole price was over $200. A lot of them didn't make it to the third Solana breakpoint. Uh, instead, what you have left is the low-level devs that comprise the majority of what I would say is the Solana community. Over the last year or so, I've dabbled with Solana, uh, being Solana curious, I guess you would call it, mostly fighting. Uh, but I've definitely learned that if I want to learn about Solana, it's not going to happen through the filter that is crypto Twitter or probably not inside of any of my Ethereum native circles either. But since I'm on my way to East Lisbon, I'm taking a flight here shortly. Uh, I decided to pop over a little bit early to Amsterdam to check out Solana Breakpoint for myself. In this episode, I talk with Anatoly, the founder of Solana, and Austin, of course, from the Solana Foundation, just to kind of get a vibe check over the arc of Solana Breakpoint, what this conference means to the Solana community, and overall what people are getting excited about as it stands today in Solana. Anatoly is persistently busy, of course, so we had him and Austin for the first 30 minutes, and then Anatoly had to run, uh, and so then me and Austin had a chance to chat about the, all of the different rabbit holes and things that are going on in Solana. Uh, I do my best to compare them to what people on this podcast might be familiar with in the Ethereum world, so for example, that they have uh, Solana Fire Dancer, and in terms of significance, that's kind of like... Uh, EIP-1559 or the Ethereum merge, at least in that it's a big protocol upgrade that the Solana community are interested in. And so I do my best, actually, I have to do the only thing that I know how to do, which is compare uh, evolutions and progress in Solana and kind of use Ethereum as a frame of reference just to gain my own understanding. And since you are likely a longtime listener of this podcast, it's probably useful for you as well. So if you are curious about what is going on in the state of Solana or you weren't able to attend Breakpoint and you just want to kind of catch a vibe, this episode is for you with Anatoly and Austin of the Solana ecosystem. So let's go ahead and get right into that conversation with Anatoly and Austin. But first, a moment to talk about these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible, especially Kraken, our preferred exchange for crypto in 2023. If you not have an account with Kraken, what are you waiting for? The bull market is about to get started and you need a centralized exchange like Kraken to buy some of your crypto assets. There is a link in the show notes to getting started with Kraken today. Kraken knows crypto. Kraken's been in the crypto game for over a decade, and as one of the largest and most trusted exchanges in the industry, Kraken is on the journey with all of us to see what crypto can be. Human history is a story of progress. It's part of us, hardwired. We're designed to seek change everywhere, to improve, to strive. And if anything can be improved, why not finance? Crypto is a financial system designed with the modern world in mind. Instant, permissionless, and 24-7. It's not perfect, and nothing ever will be perfect. But crypto is a world-changing technology at a time when the world needs it the most. That's the Kraken mission, to accelerate the global adoption of cryptocurrency so that you and the rest of the world can achieve financial freedom and inclusion. Head on over to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S territory customers by Payward Ventures Inc. PVI doing business as Kraken. Celo is the mobile first EVM compatible carbon negative blockchain built for the real world. And now something big is happening. Introducing the Celo Layer 2. It's a game changing proposal that's going to bring Celo's rapidly growing ecosystem home to Ethereum. Vitalik has shared his excitement for the Celo Layer 2 on the Celo forum. So has Ben Jones from Optimism. But why? The Celo Layer 2 will bring huge advantages like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability, and one block finality. What does all that mean? Rock solid security security, a trustless bridge to Ethereum, and more real-world use cases for Ethereum without compromise. And real-world adoption is happening. Active addresses on Celo have grown over 500% in the last six months. With the Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas using ERC20 tokens. But Celo is a community-governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forum, follow at Celo.org on Twitter, and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. 
Arbitrum is accelerating the Web3 landscape with a suite of secure Ethereum scaling solutions. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum 1 with flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. Arbitrum Nova is quickly becoming a Web3 gaming hub and social dApps like Reddit are also calling Arbitrum home. And now Arbitrum Orbit allows you to use Arbitrum's secure scaling technology to build your own layer three, giving you access to interoperable, customizable permissions with dedicated throughput. Whether you are a developer, enterprise, or a user, Arbitrum Orbit it lets you take your project to new heights. All of these technologies leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. Faster transaction speeds and significantly lower gas fees. So visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first app with Arbitrum. Experience Web3 development the way it was always meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. What's up, Bankless Nation? We're coming in from Amsterdam at Breakpoint. Number three, uh, Anatoly, Austin, how's it going, guys? It's great. Thanks for having us here. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, so uh, we're pretty far out of the city. This, I don't think we're actually in Amsterdam. We're in uh, Z Zamdam, some some other like local yeah. uh, Netherlands city. Uh, the campus is phenomenal. Uh, who has more information about how Breakpoint came together? This one? Probably Austin. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm out of the loop at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we loved Lisbon for mm -hmm. the last two years. I mean, Lisbon year one, we can get into that later, how that happened. Mm -hmm. But we really wanted to not do a distributed multi-venue conference where you had to take, you know, a shuttle bus to go between it. Um, and then also, like, quite frankly, we didn't want to end up in sort of a soulless hotel complex. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so this campus sure. just ended up being an awesome spot to keep things in Europe but also give us a little bit of feel of like the first two breakpoints where you mm -hmm. had different venues with different characteristics. So just starting at the very basics, what's Breakpoint? Oh man, uh, it is a conference that Solana Foundation puts on every year that is meant to bring the community together to sort of galvanize uh, talks and conversations around some of the biggest um, issues and topics that we're facing. It's first and foremost a developer conference, mm -hmm. um, but we've got a bunch of news and announcements that sneak into that as well. But you can probably talk more about the original vision of why even do a conference. Well, I mean, we had like Solcon mm. 2019. This was part of, we threw a, basically a meetup with some beer and pizza at uh, DevCon in Tokyo. And that was Solcon. Mm -hmm. That was really the, our first attempt at a conference. Like 20 people showed up. Um, you can literally see photos of that, of like just me being the only person in the picture in the crowd <laughs> while, while somebody's presenting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so like the Solana ecosystem, of course, has grown immensely since then. When did um, Breakpoint number one happen? And that, that was in Lisbon, correct? Yeah. Okay. When, when was that and how many people attended that? That was 2020, right? 2021. Oh, 2021. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had, you know, it was just coming out of COVID and this is sort of like the origins of the Solana network or mainnet launched in the depths of COVID, mm -hmm. right? Just as the world went into lockdown. And so the thinking was sort of in spring of 21, could we find somewhere in the world that enough people could travel to that we could actually bring everyone together who has really only been building together online? Most of these people have never met in person before. And we had this crazy idea that we could get 2,000 people to come to Lisbon hmm. um, right after COVID with this basically network that no one knew about a year ago. It, it was like the only country open too. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. For the <laughs> yeah. It was it was wild. We were we were looking through the list of like where can people get to that is easy for visas. They feel safe traveling mm -hmm. to that like we could also throw a conference in, and Lisbon was like the perfect spot. Mm -hmm. And okay, so that was 2021. What what part of the year was that in? Uh, was it November? Early yeah, November? It was November. Okay. Okay. So let's see. That that's like that at the highest point of the market, right? Where so like what what was the vibe of Breakpoint it, One? It was like very much like consensus twenty seventeen. Mm, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, uh <-huh. laughs> that kind of vintage. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, uh, but there were like some devs. There, there mm -hmm. were some developers there, and, and some folks to connect with. We. Like, you know, we gave a bunch of talks on security and programming and like all the smart contract development. And there was like a crowd of people that was like kind of staring at like the nerds and trying to figure out what they're doing. Uh, and those nerds, when all of them like hung out in one house right. that we all called the hacker house, mm -hmm. like jokingly. Uh, and it like worked out so well that um, a bunch of people just wanted to keep running these mm -hmm. like 
little hacker houses right after a breakpoint, just keep going with it. And that's really like, I don't know if, if you've been to any of the hacker houses or like you heard of Solana hacker houses. Right, yeah. It was just really that like we wanted to capture that vibe of all the developers that are just like nerding out in a, in a single place mm -hmm. and just run with it. So we threw a bunch of these like little events th around the world. Um, and like, yeah, post peak, the price is dropping, right. but like the developer engaging is rising and mm -hmm. like people are shipping code and like building products and stuff. So like it, like, I think during that year, we formed like a really strong core of like the community, like mm -hmm. all the security companies like Neodyme, all those guys that kind of became what they are today dur mm -hmm. during that year. And like all, a bunch of the products that, you know, on Solana launched that mm -hmm. through, through that. Yeah. So, okay. So if this was at the top of the market 2021 and there was like a lot of, there's like a lot of the tourists in the industry yeah. as a whole, but you're saying there was also the kernel of what yeah. later became yeah. the Solana community. Well, like just what were the lessons that were pulled out of the 2021 uh, breakpoint that, that have continued forward? I think you could like the tourists and stuff, they will show up during a, a, a bull cycle. There's, mm -hmm. It's not like you can like keep them away. Right. right? Yeah. Like we, we're not going to like, right. <laughs> <laughs> even if we tried, right? Like you can't like, tell them not to come. And that's fine. I think um, for founders or people that are trying to build a community, you really got to like be principled and really focus on those like nerds and like the people that are actually building stuff in there for the long haul as much as you can. Um, so that takes some focus and like takes like your internal team to not get like, uh, you know, um, get confused or like what the, what the mission is and stuff like that. And like, we have an awesome team and, and those folks really pulled it together. Mm -hmm. Um, and you could see like the next break point, we had a, a year of, of like everything going down. Right. Uh, it was a bunch of devs. It was like mostly right. developers, yeah. mostly like companies trying to ship product. Um, and kind of like the same thing happened again, right? Like I would say this last year, right. The last break point, on the flight back, like the worst possible thing yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. I could have ever imagined happened. <laughs> and if you were to told me then that like, this is what it's going to be like a year from now, it would have like probably punched you right. at that time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, but, but the, the second uh, Solana breakpoint, what you're f referring to is the second Solana breakpoint yeah. was like right before FTX. Yeah. But like yeah. retroactively it didn't, the Solana breakpoint was just a Solana breakpoint. Like FTX happened right afterwards, but like the conference itself was totally isolated. Yeah, right? it was yeah. awesome. We had like, um, I don't know, like 60 game companies showed mm -hmm. up for game day. They were like all like launching like games and stuff. We had, I don't know, a bunch of devs registered for that hacker house. I think like 1500, mm -hmm. which is like yeah. insane. Um, there's like the energy was great and people were building, building stuff. And then like right at the end of it, right. right. At, I think at like the closing party, effectively, yeah. I'm seeing all these tweets about like FTX <laughs> imploding. It was well, something, it, it happened it, at the end, not yeah, right before. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. So like, uh, it was, I don't know. I, I think the reason why we're still here is because those developers stuck around. They mm -hmm. weren't tourists, right? right? They actually see some value in this technology and they continued building. That's mm -hmm. what kind of really, that's, I think the goal of all these conferences, all these events and hacker mm -hmm. houses is to like get that, you know, the social glue that's going to like fork the network when something bad happens, mm -hmm. you need to actually build it. It's not just going to like happen automatically and you got to get those folks in and uh, like it or not. I think those people have to be pretty technical. They have to mm -hmm. understand how the system works. It's usually going to be your pool of developers or validators. So like you got to invest in that. Mm -hmm. So we're at break point three now in, in 2023. Um, and understanding that some people attending Breakpoint 3 have been to all three breakpoints. Uh, and, you know, at some point, like three plus years, you're seeing the same three, fa like the th uh, same faces three years in a row now, you know, in, in other spots yeah. in the world, but also at yeah. Breakpoint. And for some people in the Solana's community, it's going to feel like that's home for them. Uh, and so, you know, three plus years, that's a, that's a lot of time as a, yeah. as a community together. How would you describe the evolution of Breakpoint to where we are today? Like what, what would be the, 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 like, the sentiment around uh, Breakpoint 3. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's great about this year is 
we had something called MevCamp last mm -hmm. year, um, which sort of spontaneously popped up. A bunch of validators and the Mango team and a few others and Jito decided last year, oh, we're going to do a pre-breakpoint event. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of people who attended that said that was one of the most high value things they got out of the year mm -hmm. was like that community focused on high performance blockchain. Mm -hmm. And so they actually ran MevCamp here formally as part of Breakpoint. Um, Block Zero was a validator conference that kicked off beforehand. Mm -hmm. IBC Amsterdam came here and did a whole conference on blockchain uh, connectivity in, in day one. And so we're seeing like Breakpoint go from something that like was 90% organized by the foundation to something that's maybe 65% organized mm -hmm. by the foundation this year. And maybe next year it's 45% organized. And it's that long journey to say that like, the foundation and its role here is really a part of it. It's not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And to start handing over bigger and bigger core components of this conference to the ecosystem. And that's where that like, to know that the ecosystem of developers and builders is strong enough to actually organize big events that draw their own crowd is uh, is really awesome to see. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest takeaway, at least. What's yours? Yeah, they want to do less work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but that, it, it's really cool. Like, I mean every breakpoint there's somebody trying to do something on their own and like throw events that like surprise us and like i think um it's important that like the folks at the foundation recognize that and try to incorporate it and like kind of run with it because mm -hmm. all the good ideas come from the community you know mm -hmm. we're we're yes. we don't know what we're doing <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, the uh, aesthetic of breakpoint i think is is pretty interesting was it the, it's very apple-y the the, the yeah. apple design is like very very prominent in breakpoint three was that it, a lot of this stuff, I think, comes from Raj. Mm -hmm. Like, I would say he's like the spiritual designer of Solana. Like, it doesn't come from me. Sure. I can tell you yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> was, was Breakpoint 2 and 1 like that? Or is that a relatively new, like, design design kind of vibe? We had um, more time this year than we've had with Breakpoint 1 or 2. So I think there was a bit more focus on, you know, visual design and sort of the the animations you see on the main stage right. and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and Ross, our creative director at the foundation, like has a huge hand in, in working with Raj and making mm -hmm. sure that stuff comes together well. Yeah. Um, this is also the, we have a events director, Ellie at mm -hmm. the foundation and, you know, she came from Netflix and ran a lot of really high profile events mm -hmm. for them. And so, um, you know, the conference is growing up in a lot of ways. It's growing up through more participants and greater decentralization and all these really awesome things we get to do, but it's also growing up from a production standpoint right. too. And that like, you know, the, the first hacker house you were talking about, it was literally like a bunch of folding tables in a room mm -hmm. and like bunch of power cords being run over the right. ground and like I'm sure it was totally not up to code and like <laughs> that's awesome and, but at some point you know it's like all right well we have a few months to plan this thing let's mm -hmm. see if we can do it a little more right what about the the composition of who is attending breakpoint three like wh who's coming here um it's I would say like just from talking to random people it's a lot of like like people that have been around in the community for like a year or two. Like I think it, it's folks that have kind of stuck around, but I also see a bunch of new faces. Um, mostly developers, at least the people that come up to me, it's mm -hmm. and like it's mostly devs, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Like I, I think that's that's like the goal, right? Get get a bunch of engineers together, mm -hmm. um, get folks talking and like meeting each other and build those relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's more engineers from other ecosystems here too. I mean. You're here. Justin yeah. Bonds is definitely here. not an engineer, but no, yes, no, I am here. but <laughs> but we're we're starting to see more more folks who are more engaged in sort of the research community and other networks start to look more seriously at Solana, and that's just hugely flattering to see. Like Rune is here as well from Maker, so it's a good collection of folks. Yeah, as, especially this last year, I'd say from at least from my perception, like this has been the year. May, maybe you guys can be more informed about this, but the year like Solana chewed glass uh -huh. uh, through, the, <laughs> through the bear market. Yeah. Uh, how, how has that like impacted just like the the cultural vibe and and what this event means I, for the community? I have a lot more gray hair. This is, <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah, this was a uh, I would say like the hardest year for me, like kind of the most painful because it was such a slog. Mm -hmm. It's it wasn't like you know, an outage or something, you know, right. happens, you'd like work through it, you know, the engineering problem, and then you're, you kind of, it's behind you. But like, um, it was really cool to see like how many people, like, again, surprising, like people just stuck around. They're like, mm -hmm. you know, they're like, oh yeah, FTX collapsed. I guess that happened. I'm just right. going to keep shipping my code and like sh shipping my product because that's what they're focused on. So that was awesome to see. Like, it really means that 
people do see something special about the technology and really want to continue like investing in it. In it. Um, and those are the folks that really create all the value, like if create the community, they kind of carry the, carry the, the whole network. Um, so I don't know. It was, uh, it's cool to see them. Cool to shake hands with everyone. I'm like grateful for everyone that showed up. Mm-hmm. Anything, anything from you about your, the evolution of the Solana community here? Yeah. You know, uh, so what Tolly was saying about folks just continuing to build and ship, I think what, what I've seen personally is like Solana DeFi this year, like all the stuff that was being worked on through 2022, like it just shipped this year. Mm. And it's been really incredible to see like new versions of Jupiter coming out and what they're able to do, um, like MarginFi and some of the stuff they've been building, um, the new Orca product that's launching this week. Like there's a lot of really good sort of, I don't know if you call it DeFi 2.0, but like some new generation of like Solana DeFi and like right. the work Squads has been doing on multi-sigs and mm-hmm. like those hardcore real code-based projects, like that was the real test for me when I was like, oh, all these folks are still are still fully committed to Solana. They're still building here. They're still shipping awesome stuff. Um, and they they did what everyone always tells you to do, which is build through the bear. Mm-hmm. But like they actually did it, <laughs> you know? What, what would you say is the thing that, uh, or the, the handful of things that really excites the Solana community as it stands today? Like what, what are people looking forward to? Um, I mean, like I think uh, you can you can kind of tell the focus between the Solana like conferences and Ethereum. There's a lot less scaling talks, mm-hmm. right? Like a lot of companies are focused on consumer end mm-hmm. things, and it's like it's I guess our, our vibe. Like I, I'm c- probably coming from like myself and from from everyone else. Like at least my message is we got scaling taken care of. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so like the kind of people we attract are the ones that at least believe in it, or at least like can verify that. Or it, it mostly works and can focus on like consumer and products. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's pretty interesting. I think like there's a lot less um, like it's, it's harder. It's really, it, it's much harder to build like consumer and products. It's easier to build infra, right. And to like raise for it. So a lot of the folks here are like really grinding for product market fit, like in, in the trenches, really trying to get users. And a lot of the conversations that I have with devs are like, and things that I'm not an expert in. I can tell them everything about like systems engineering and, and stuff like that. But what they really care about is how do I grow? How do I get like users? Where do I like, um, you know, like what advice can I give them in terms of product development? So that's like a, a ton of learning for me as well. Mm-hmm. What's your perspective, Austin? What, what's getting the Solana community excited these days? Yeah, you know, there's a lot. I will say... It's definitely the consumer focused applications are like, there's this understanding in the Solana community that like we've been waiting for consumer facing applications to hit like, oh, it's been a UX problem. Oh, it's been a UI problem. Oh, it's a regulation problem. Oh, it's a scaling problem. Oh, there's no good self custody solutions. Like that's been sort of, and this is not, you know, and specific to any network, but there's sort of been like an excuse mindset, Mm -hmm. I think in crypto for a number of years that like, oh, we were ready to build consumer applications, but USDC isn't available in New York. So suddenly we can't do it. And there's just a lot of founders attracted to the Solana ecosystem that sort of say, eh, I'm just going to build it. Mm -hmm. And like, it's not my perfect vision. Like Sling launched yesterday here. It's peer-to-peer Venmo built on, you know, US dollar stable coins. And it's not available in New York. And they're just like, yep, it works in 30 countries. Doesn't work in New York, like too bad. Mm -hmm. And that is like a thing that is just like a, like this, this is vibe of just like build and ship and like we can figure it out later. And something you see in a lot of Web2 companies is that people seem to be really worried about building the perfect product before they ship it. And there's like a willingness to experiment in production that's always been part of the crypto ethos for non-consumer applications. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing that move more into the consumer side, mm-hmm. I think. Wait, is there, uh, what kind of consumer applications are, are going around that uh, are worth noting if people want to go and explore some? Yeah, so I, I would say Sling, um, which just launched, is really pretty interesting. What Drip House is doing with sort of free NFT collections that are time limited as opposed to being um, number limited. Those, those to me are particularly interesting. What Helium's doing with their $5 mobile plan. Um, Fuse uh, account abstracted wallet. If, uh, it's pretty cool. So you can like basically no seed phrase. You set up multiple devices that are part of your own multi-sig. Right. Um, so yeah. that, that's pretty cool to see. Like I, I, those are like the features that I think like 
take a lot of design work and, and uh, folks to really think through all the really, really complicated UX challenges and, uh, and like put it together in a product that um, improves security and usability. You rarely see both of those happening at the same time. Sure. Yeah, I've been impressed with squads v4. Yeah. Cool. And it's totally, so every time I see you, you're running around pretty busy. Uh, once Breakpoint ends, what are you going to go do? What's like the first thing that you're going to focus on? I'm going to hang out with my family and kids. I had to miss like Halloween with the kids, which is... Oh, oh <laughs> like, no. <laughs> <laughs> they were so sad that I wasn't there that they saved me candy. Oh, that's nice. That's <laughs> nice. Okay, but, but what about inside of the Solana ecosystem? Like what's first on your agenda here? Um, I like... Uh, it's like I'm as a founder, right? You're often like do whatever, whatever is necessary, right? You okay. jump in and you're like, I will, you know, help people to brand. I'll like do messaging and stuff like that. The ecosystem is mature enough. Foundation is mature enough. And like all these things are actually getting uh, filled with experts that are much better than me at like mm -hmm. all the things except systems engineering. So I get to actually do some, some of that again. Mm. So I'm like working on the multiple concurrent leader design, like stuff like that, like trying to make sure ABI V2 and like all the runtime changes, uh, land and like are robust. <laughs> So like I get to nerd out, which mm -hmm. is pretty great. Yeah, so, <laughs> as a founders uh, grow and their their project grow, grows, they tend to go into this like an operations role, where they're they're not really actually doing the thing that made them successful in the first place. They are now managing. How much of that? How, how much are you like managing that, and operating? That, that was like the last two years. Like uh, you kind of like the last three years. I would say like as soon as we launched, I couldn't do s systems work at all. Like I was like basically running around, you know, talking to everyone, almost like a sales role, I would say. And like now, like there's just so many other people that are much that are much better than me at, at like all these other functions. So it's pretty great. Okay, so pivoting the conversation to something completely different. What would you guys say is the long term uh, relations between Solana and Ethereum? Awesome. I'll throw this one to you. Uh, I mean, I don't know exactly what. There's a lot of different ways that could go. I sure. would say, like, to start, I don't think we directly view Ethereum as a competitor, sure. right? I think there there's very different approaches to what's being built on Ethereum, what's being built on Solana. Um, I know Tully's got some fun ideas about using Solana as a sequencer mm -hmm. um, for an L2. Um, but there's a lot, you know, I think at the end of the day, like... What I would love to see is that folks who are using Ethereum for what Ethereum is great at, they use Solana for what's great at too. Mm. Like the classic example of this is there's no reason the ApeCoin airdrop should have been on Ethereum, mm. mm -hmm. right? Now, yes, you could talk about offloading that into layer two, but you could have dropped ApeCoin on Solana and people mm. would have been able to spend basically zero dollars on gas fees and then mm. bridge it back over at their convenience if they want to instead of paying $3,500 to claim an airdrop. Mm. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of um, technology synergies that can happen between them. I hate to use that. Right. The S word. Uh, <laughs> Synergies. Yeah. What are you even totally thinking about? Yeah, what's your specific um, I think like there's like this nice narrative that I keep in my head and I, I don't know how true it is, is that like Bitcoin is like stateless money, Ethereum is settlement, and then Solana's execution. It like sounds good in theory, but mm -hmm. like there's obviously feature overlap. Right? right, like sure. Ethereum is also great stateless money, right. right? And Solana also implements settlement, and there's going to be tension between all those things, mm -hmm. right? And that's fine, right? Like there's going to be competition. Some people prefer one or the other, and like to me, that's great because like that forces innovation. People have to think through hard problems and like figure out like, you know, how do I build this? Maybe the same thing in a different network. It actually does spark ideas and, and moves moves the industry forward. So like. It'll it'll be competitive. It'll be mm -hmm. somewhat like uh, open source, you know, like BSD devs and Linux devs compete, but they share ideas. It's it's all good, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I would also say that like we have this human brains are really bad at uh, not competing when you put a chart up. So the fact yeah. that we have a market cap chart. Yeah, there's a leaderboard. Yeah. There's a leaderboard, <laughs> right? And like, like, Bitcoin didn't need to fail for Ethereum to succeed. And Ethereum doesn't need to fail uh -huh. for Solana to yeah. gain mass adoption, right? And like, Solana failing would not give Ethereum any more right. adoption. And right. globally, we're just dealing with such a tiny fraction of the pie that currently mm -hmm. uses crypto that like, 
there's all of this like PVP, one group punching each other right. in the face, like that is just totally unnecessary. And it's mm-hmm. just because we have a leaderboard. Yeah, I, that's a good point. I've never really considered the leaderboard as like the, uh, <laughs> the uh, instigator of so many yeah. fighting fights. Yeah. I, I think like as long as people don't do personal attacks, people right. arguing about tech and vision, all that stuff is fine. I think that is like part of our search for truth, right? Yeah, We're trying sure. to figure out what, what makes sense, what doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't see a world where Solana succeeds and Ethereum fails. I think that's just like right. ridiculous, right? Mm-hmm. Like um, Ethereum is awesome. I think the reason that their technology is moving in that direction is because of the success that they had. They're mm-hmm. kind of like in a specific spot. If I was in involved in the Ethereum community, I'd probably be arguing for the exact same design decision as mm-hmm. they're doing now because that's the natural path, right, right to go. Um, so like, I think it's totally fine. The competition's great, right? Like, I think it's awesome. You know, I hope like the optimizations that like Kevin Bowers did for like 256 bit mm-hmm. multiplication end up, you know, in, you know, increasing EVM throughput. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. it's all open source code. It's it's all good. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I think there's one thing I've uh, just learned from just chatting with the people here at Breakpoint is that there's a certain archetype of of type of person that comes to the Solana community, and it's like this like low level. Uh, low level devs, right? Like the X Teslas, the X like SpaceX type of the Google type of people that I like. So you find some of these people in Ethereum, but really there's a lot of these people that Solana attracted that I don't think would have joined any community because of just the nature of how that blockchain was built versus Solana. There's something about like the way that Solana, the, the emphasis on hardware, for example, has attracted a certain dev mindset. Uh, that I think is kind of like the base of the Solana community. At least that's that's my yeah, perception. Yeah, that, that's that's weirdly true, and I don't fully understand why. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I am one of those people. Like, right. I'm an embedded systems dev. I can't. Uh-huh. It like maybe it's because like I like set the narrative, and people mm-hmm. are like, oh, I, this this guy sounds like me. But like, yeah, I don't know. We're a bunch of like systems nerds. It's what we mm-hmm. like to geek out on. So, Anatoly, what's it like to be sort of like some sort of a uh, community cultural leader i can i can it's say weird. more more religious type figures and words to, but i i won't but like the the whole like <laughs> cult of anatoly what, what's that like to have uh it's really weird uh i'm blessed that it only occurs like during breakpoint in the uh-huh. solana event if i go anywhere else nobody cares <laughs> <laughs> so do you get recognized in real life out and about no no, no okay. like at all which is awesome even at an Ethereum conference, like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> so, so like, yeah, that, that, that is actually like, this is like the most I can like stomach it. Um, I think like, I don't know, it's part of the job. I think like, mm-hmm. um, I hope I do my, like drive people to go build better code more mm-hmm. open source code and kind of collaborate. So I hope that that message is, is landing. Cool. Beautiful. Uh, Anatoly, I know you got a hard stop, so we're gonna. I'm gonna let you go, and then I'm gonna ask some awesome some technical questions. Awesome, dude! Thank you so much for for coming on and speaking to the Bankless Nation. Appreciate dude, it. Thank you for coming here. Of course, have a good one. Congratulations on Breakpoint. Thank you. MetaMask Portfolio is your one-stop shop to navigate the world of DeFi. And now bridging seamlessly across networks doesn't have to be so daunting anymore. With competitive rates and convenient routes, MetaMask Portfolio's bridge feature lets you easily move your tokens from chain to chain using popular layer one and layer two networks. And all you have to do is select the network you want to bridge from and where you want your tokens to go. From there, MetaMask vets and curates the different bridging platforms to find the most decentralized, accessible, and reliable bridges for you. To tap in into the hottest opportunities in crypto, you need to be able to plug into a variety of networks and nobody makes that easier than MetaMask Portfolio. Instead of searching endlessly through the world of bridge options, click the bridge button on your MetaMask extension or head over to metamask.io slash portfolio to get started. You know Uniswap, it's the world's largest decentralized exchange with over $1.4 trillion in trading volume. You know this because we talk about it endlessly on Bankless. It's Uniswap, but Uniswap is becoming so much more. Uniswap Labs just released the Uniswap Mobile Wallet for iOS, the newest, easiest way to trade tokens on the go. With a Uniswap wallet, you can easily create or import a new wallet, buy crypto on any available exchange with your debit card with extremely low fiat on-ramp fees, and you can seamlessly swap on Mainnet, Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism. On the Uniswap mobile wallet, you can store and display your beautiful NFTs, and you can also explore Web3 with the in-app search features, market leaderboards, and price charts, or use Wallet Connect to connect to any Web3 application. So you can now go directly to DeFi with the Uniswap mobile wallet. Safe, simple custody, 
from the most trusted team in DeFi. Download the Uniswap wallet today on iOS. There's a link in the show notes. Are you launching a token? Is it already live? How are you managing the legal and tax for providing token awards for your team? Toku simplifies everything about managing token grant compensation, and you can get started with them for free. You'll have access to top-notch legal and tax support to handle the distribution and management of tokens for your team. Toku caters to every step in the process, from user-friendly legal templates for granting tokens to tracking vesting periods and calculating withholding taxes. Toku understands every grant structure, token purchase agreements, restricted token awards, restricted token units, token options, and all the other ones. Toku is already simplifying this today for leading companies like Protocol Labs, DYDX Foundation, Mina Foundation, and many more. You can learn more about how Toku can help you streamline your token management and get started for free. Visit Toku at toku.com slash bankless or click the link in the description below. Cool. Okay. Uh, so there's like just a handful of things that I know that people just like really give a fuck about here at, <laughs> at Breakpoint. Um, uh, Fire Dancer, I know, is that perhaps at the top of the list. Yeah. And then there's a few other ones. But um, I kind of want to just like peel back and like show whoever whoever's interested where the rabbit holes are for Solana. If they're trying to learn like more, just like rather than approaching Solana head on, like what are the rabbit holes? Uh, yeah. And so we'll start with Fire Dancer because I think that's the thing that everyone is like super stoked about. Uh, what is Fire Dancer and why is everyone so stoked about it? Yeah, so Fire Dancer is a new implementation of the Solana runtime mm -hmm. and the consensus model and networking stack, uh, which is written in C. Okay. And so uh, there's a few things here. One, one is C is just an incredibly fast performant language for this sort of thing. It's sort of the language of choice for like high frequency traders mm -hmm. and high performance systems. Um, but the other piece of it is it's just a complete rewrite. And so there are five years of development on the code base that Solana Labs originally created that's just a spider web at this mm. point, right? Like any code base right. that's been worked on for that long, it's like trying to build a house when you don't know the end architecture of the right. house. Uh -huh. And so just going through and starting from the beginning and saying we have a spec we can build against and we're going to build a client optimized to squeeze as much performance possible out. That's really the whole point of the Fire Dancer project. Okay, so is it kind of like when you clean out your refrigerator, you take everything out of the refrigerator, then you clean the refrigerator, and then you put everything back in, rather than just like rearranging the, you, you know that metaphor? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I'd, say, I'd say actually, uh, so a good metaphor uh -huh. would be, it's like taking a house built in the 1800s mm -hmm. down to the studs mm. and then rebuilding the inside, okay. right? You can retrofit in new electricity right. like without taking the walls out. You can put in a new bathroom. Mm -hmm. But like realistically, if you want to turn a really old house and they do this all over Europe, right, into mm -hmm. somewhere totally beautiful, you got to take it down to the studs. You got to right. take it down to the walls. You uh -huh. put in new stuff and then like that space is totally transformed. Okay. And that's kind of the best analogy here for what Fire Dancer is. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of different components of that. So the version that was announced to be on Testnet now is actually, uh, we call it Franken Dancer. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit of a Frankenstein of some of the code from the existing validator client with the parts that uh, the team building Fire Dancer, which is a lot of engineers at Jump Trading mm -hmm. Group have been building, um, that really speeds up certain components of okay. it. Right. And that's kind of what that testnet version is today over time. And it's probably you know, another year or two to mm -hmm. replace all the bits of code that the Solana Labs team built. Mm -hmm. um, but we're getting to a place where there is enough performance improvements, enough performance improvements in those new components that it's a real step function change. OK, so uh, just to kind of regurgitate everything, yeah. um, Bitcoin, the, one of the reasons one of my big biggest critiques about Bitcoin is that it's got one client. And so if Bitcoin has a bug, then that that bug is Bitcoin. And all of a sudden you have to like socially engineer around that. Well, I think they've got like four clients, but only one client, 98% of Bitcoin right. runs one client. Right, right, yeah. right, right. And so uh, it's what we all, in in order to have a robust decentralized blockchain system, we need multiple clients. Yes. Uh, and so we have the Solana core client, which is like Sol Solana number one, yes. client number one, uh, which like I'm guessing is like the vast majority of the clients that run Solana at the uh, in in the past, yes. right? Uh, and so now we're working on Fire Dancer, which is a client number two. But it's not just uh, and so like you use the spec of the first client to generate a shape of what the next client will be, Fire Dancer, what it will be. And so we're talking to and we're pointing towards the same truth that is Solana, right? Yeah, and it's actually it's actually the third client. But third client. Okay. So what, what was the a, second? There's a client uh, built by Jito. Right. And so but that's just a fork of the first one. It's not. 
Uh, it is 90% similar code. Uh -huh. And the, the main thing about the Jito client is it has the same upstream dependencies as the Solana Labs client. Right. This is something that Ethereum has done quite well, is that not only are there several different clients, but those clients are written in different programming mm -hmm. languages. So for example, if a bug is triggered in the networking stack software of a library that's shared between two clients, even if two different teams wrote those clients, like you mm -hmm. have two different implementations of a Rust client, that upstream dependency can still cause a bug. Mm -hmm. And so the nice thing about having one in C and one in right. Rust is that those are totally different code bases. Right, sure. Um, so uh -huh. that's kind of like, and I think this is something where, you know, Ethereum has, I think it's two or three, to, they technically have like six clients, mm -hmm. but uh, most of them share the same dependency tree. There's sure. there's two or three different code bases. Sure. And so okay. that's really what the difference with FireDancer is, is it's right. not just a new client, it's a new dependency tree. Sure. Okay. And so that's where you get that multi-client robustness, at least now with, with two exactly. different clients. Exactly. Like, like the Jito client and the Solana Labs client provide social robustness mm -hmm. and a, a, the FireDancer client provides technical robustness. Sure. Except the FireDancer client is also supposed to be like much more performant. Yes. Correct? Uh, how would you, can you measure that? Is there a way to like put numbers behind that? Uh, putting numbers behind anything in crypto is always like a mistake. A, a but iron, what, yeah. what, I'll, what I'll say <laughs> is that um, there are key components of the FireDancer stack that are a hundred times as performant as the existing one. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the network is going to be a hundred times faster, right? right? But what it means is that, um, you know, it's, it's called Andel's law, right? Mm -hmm. You can, if you have 10 components in the system and you make nine of them a hundred times faster, right. the system is still the same speed. Right. You take that right. last one, you make it faster. Right. It's a low, lowest common denominator. Right. The least performant part of the system is the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we expect to see Fire Dancer be an, probably an order of magnitude change mm -hmm. in the Solana network um, at start. But that could go up from there, mm -hmm. uh, depending on a whole bunch of different things that we have to see in prod. So why would anyone run the old client when they would just can they, they could just run Fire Dancer instead? So what will probably happen, and you know, it's all up to the community and how they decide right. to run things, of course. But very similar to what the big node operators do in Ethereum, where they run one client in primary and they run one client in failover. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this would, you know, if there's a bug in Prism right. or Lighthouse, the other one can take over. Right. Okay. And so for Solana, what we would see is because Ethereum is targeting a certain performance threshold, mm -hmm. right? And all it makes it easy because all the clients are building to what's a fairly low performance threshold. Mm -hmm. With Fire Dancer, they're trying to squeeze as much performance out of possible out of the same hardware that everyone else is running. Mm -hmm. And so what we expect to see is that probably everyone will run the Fire Dancer client um, in primary configuration. And if there's a bug in the network, right. it would basically Flip fail back, back yeah. into the mm -hmm. Solana Labs version. And yes, that will certainly be a performance hit, right? You mm -hmm. might see fees on the network spike because there's now a 10,000 transaction capacity as sure. opposed to 100,000 transaction right. capacity. You can think of it almost as falling into like a safe mode. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like when with the escalator breaks, it turns into stairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. The, the analogy on, a, on Ethereum here is that, you know, you can you can have execution continue even though finality can't be reached. Right, right. Yeah. And that yeah, happened yeah. a few times mm -hmm. this year for mm -hmm. Ethereum. And it provided a worse experience, but it wasn't a whole right. stop of the network. Sure, 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 sure. Okay. All right. So that, that's Fire Dancer. It, like, I kind of am categorizing it in my brain as like when the Ethereum community got all excited about like 1559 or even like the, the merge. This sure. is like kind of just like we're getting a protocol upgrade. Yes. So this is about like a comprehensive new like Solana 2.0. Is it fair to call it like Solana 2.0? I think if you add Fire Dancer plus Runtime version two, okay. that's when you. It's fair to call it Solana two point uh -huh. Like the the best analogy I would say right now is like we're we're building the most performant gasoline car imaginable, sure. and eventually with Runtime V two, it switches over to being like an electric powertrain. Okay, what's a Runtime V two? So Runtime V2 is a whole bunch of um, improvements in the Solana runtime. This is probably about a year out, right? Okay. So just to set expectations on this. Okay, so we have 1559 and then the merge is in like a year. Yeah, like, yeah exactly. Like this. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, Runtime V2 is a whole bunch of optimizations in terms of um, reducing memory copies in the mm -hmm. runtime. will make just things snappier, uh, but it'll include type-rich bytecode format, which will allow a bunch of programs to talk to each other more easily with less plumbing. And so that'll improve like the efficiency of... You know, a core component of Solana is you, you know, you use Jupyter Aggregator and it'll hit six different markets. Mm -hmm. um, that'll make something like that much less compute expensive to run okay. on the network. Um, there's also a bunch of zero knowledge proof um, and different curve support that gets added into runtime V2. Mm -hmm. And so some of that stuff is in the network today. So like 116, which just shipped, includes a ZK proof uh, component for confidential transfers, which mm -hmm. was demoed as part of the token 2022 yeah. mm -hmm. spec. 
a lot of words that we can get into yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, Runtime V2 is sort of like the closest thing to a Solana 2.0 that sure. we have on the roadmap. Okay. Okay, cool. The the confidential transactions, can you explain a little bit more about that? Is that like privacy built into the base layer? Yeah, exactly. So, well, base layer is a, a tricky question. Sure. So there is something called um, Token 2022, mm-hmm. which is a token program on the network. Right. Nothing to do with the conference or the events. No, yeah. no, nothing at all. Uh, it was just a spec that was finalized right. in the year of 2022 okay. and uh-huh. then ships in 2023. Okay. Right, is the sort of thing there. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so Token 2022, it's a program on the network. And mm-hmm. Solana is built on this idea of program reusability. Right. Uh-huh. So Token 2022, or the, ac- the actual token program that everyone uses to send tokens around, that's not part of the base layer of Solana, technically. Mm, it's part okay. of the Solana program library, sure. which exists sure. on top of it. Right, right, right. And it's so no it's more... It's a file that you can open? Yeah, I mean, like, I guess in the Ethereum terminology, it's enshrined, right? right? Oh, but okay. it's not oh, actually yeah, 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 part yeah, yeah. of the code base, right? right? If you download the Solana validator package... Mm-hmm. It's not like it forces you to use right. the token program. That's like a choice a user can make right. when they okay. want to transfer stuff. Okay. Um, token 2022 is a new version of that token program. Mm-hmm. Um, you can think of it sort of as like, uh, you know, upgrades that have happened to like the um, the NFT standard on Ethereum sure. over the years. Right. It's like we had this version. Now we have a new version. Now mm-hmm. we have a new version. Sure. Right. Uh-huh. Um, and part of that includes confidential transfers. Mm-hmm. And so what that means is that you and I could transact and the world would be able to see that we transacted, but it couldn't see the details of what actually transferred between us. Okay. And there were a bunch of um, basically system calls that had to be integrated into the actual runtime layer, the program layer of Solana, to make that possible. Okay. All right. So that's Fire Dancer, Runtime V2. Uh, and Runtime V2 is uh, about a year out. Yeah. Uh, what else is worth bringing surfacing about, just like the significant things that are getting people excited about uh, Solana? Yeah. I mean... I. Token 2022 is one where there's a lot of features that I think are going to be really powerful for folks. There's Mm -hmm. a whole trend in sort of enterprise space nowadays of like permissioned environments, Mm -hmm. right? And the the thesis right now is that very much like in the old days of email servers, like, well, if you're a company, you have to run your own email server. Mm -hmm. And we saw the early version of this where it was like, oh, I I need an Ethereum fork Mm -hmm. for my company, right? right? I can't run on mainnet, right? right? And now the version of that is like, I need my own permissioned L2. Right. And in all those situations, it still requires running a bunch of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so Token 2022 has things like uh, transfer approvals and transfer hooks built into it. So I, as an issuer of, let's say, a tokenized fund, can say only wallets that I've whitelisted can actually buy Mm -hmm. and sell and interact with this. And the cool part about that is it's actually fully composable with the existing DeFi ecosystem. So you may be able to go on, you know, Mango Markets or Jupiter Mm -hmm. Aggregator or whatever, um, you know, DeFi marketplace you you love and say, oh, I want to actually interact with this fund in addition to buying tokenized Bitcoin Mm -hmm. or some dog money or something like that. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you've gone through a KYC process with them and they've approved you, you'd be able to participate in that token. So it's kind of mixing that idea of like fully permissionless DeFi Mm -hmm. and the regulated permission DeFi into the same user space. Right. And that I think is a much better experience than saying like, oh, if I want to trade X or Y or Z, I have to go to this permissioned environment. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. So it's allowing for a permissioned environment to exist inside of the larger environment. Exactly. Rather than having that to be like an island over there. Right. Right. There's just simple, like not not compliance, but just like uh, if this, then that statement that keep, yeah. keep rules uh, enforced. Yeah, it's sort of just like how Circle technically has freeze authority on right. all USDC. Yeah. Uh-huh. They could, using token 2022, mm-hmm. someone could create a stable coin that's a whitelisted stable right. coin, sure. right? That's like, um, oh, uh, you know, a classic example of this is actually like Andrew Yang's like Burrow Bucks idea hmm. back from the campaign, which uh-huh. was like, oh, let's switch over like our food stamp program right. to saying like, you know, we, we both live in Brooklyn. Like, mm-hmm. if you're on an assistance program in Brooklyn, you can only spend your dollars right. in merchants in right. Brooklyn, right. right? Someone could do something like that fully on chain and it would be able to sit in their wallet just like any other token would, right. but they could only spend it at select merchants, right? Because right? the criticism of these programs is everyone just buys stuff on Amazon and right, then like, right. it doesn't yeah. help the local economy. Yeah, 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 sure. You can think of all of those types of things you could now build mm-hmm. using the token 2022 standard. Cool, okay. All right, uh, what else? What else, what other rabbit holes are worth illuminating? Uh, oh man, let's see. So I think, um, the, we are seeing a lot more of interest in sort of Solana L2s for mm. different types of use cases. All right. I thought that, I thought that's like a, just like a juxtaposition that, that shouldn't exist. What, Solana L2s? So L2s on Ethereum are used for scale. 
Right. <laughs> L2s on Solana will likely be used for specific types of applications and execution that requires differences at the hardware level. Cool. So a great example of this is something like the render network. Right. Mm -hmm. So render is a GPU rendering network. It's used for everything from like Beeple style, mm -hmm. like very complex 3D renders to like AI models and training. Mm -hmm. It's just like a GPU farm in the cloud kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there's a lot of ways to do this. One is like you just say, oh, people have their systems and, you know, there's an off chain database of how performing your computer is versus mine and the render network assigns stuff. Mm -hmm. Another way to do that is to literally run an L2 on Solana that says, you can only be a part of this L2. You can only be a validator on this L2 if you pass a certain benchmark. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. And that means basically like if I go buy, you know, mm. a super high end GPU, I'm now permissionlessly and decentralized added to this L2 because the L2 is not for scale. Right. It's to prove that I have a powerful enough GPU right. to run these rendering jobs. This sounds like um, a hardware instead of like an app specific chain yeah. is like a hardware specific chain. Exactly. Huh. Exactly. Huh. Right. You could also see someone build Building, I, I've joked for a long time that someone should build slow Lana, mm. which is just a uh, a slower version of right. Solana that requires less bandwidth. Right. That you know, if what you want to do is you want to be able to basically uh, verify just small pieces of state, like mm -hmm. DA sampling, kind of sucks. Sure. Right. Like it's better right. than nothing, but like light clients are not full nodes. Right. right? right that's right. that's like a full yeah, yeah. statement in itself. But you could build an L2 that actually was just a slower version of Solana mm -hmm. that could be used for different types of transfers, mm -hmm. right? If you're trying to run, you know, like we have a lot of nonprofits like that want to actually be able to do payouts via mm -hmm. Solana in, you know, developing countries, mm -hmm. right, for their nonprofit work where True. there's really great connectivity, but there's not necessarily great bandwidth. Mm -hmm. You could see them running an L2 environment to basically slow down the network. So if more people want to be able to run validators or just state proof generators for that network, mm -hmm. they could do something like that without necessarily the system requirements of Solana. Right. Now, is this uh, more of like a thought experiment or actually a practical idea? So the first one with hardware specific right. requirements is becoming real. Sure. Um, on the second I mean, one, may, mainly slow Lana. That sounds like closer to just like we could do this. <laughs> so so actually, um, Code Wallet has kind of built that. Mm -hmm. um, they've built themselves a whole sort of uh, L two architecture on Solana that they use to actually make sure that they can still do transfers if the Solana mainnet is ever offline. Mm, okay. Right. Ah, so there's okay. those yeah, use yeah. cases too where right. they're maintaining their own Merkle trees and mm -hmm. therefore they can update a bunch of stuff sort of offline. Um, and then they can always push those changes right. once the network, you know, sure. block production resumes. Okay, cool. So it's a little bit uh, a sovereignty play. Yeah, yeah. Sure. There, there's lots of those types of applications. And I think most sovereignty solutions can be solved on the L1 with mm -hmm. token 2022. Right. But, you know, there's some other applications where, you know, like, like Rune was talking about for Maker, mm -hmm. they expressly want the ability to hard fork. Right. And they want that ability to hard fork because they're trying to build a 100-year DAO and they have to assume that somewhere in the next 100 years, mm -hmm the software is going to get hacked because mm -hmm. the only sure bet you can make in software is mm -hmm. that something someday will get hacked. Sure. Right. right enough right, monkeys right. on enough yeah. typewriters yeah. will hack, we'll, we'll hack Bitcoin. <laughs> right. And that's a good bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, there's so many different things about Breakpoint that like, I, like I've been learning that like Solana is like pushing the frontier of and of its own, uh, of, you know, and of its own right. But one thing that I noticed that Solana is really behind on yeah. is governance. Governance conversations are so early. Uh, what, what's your perspective? Like, can, just give us a sit rep on just like what your perspective is on Solana governance and, and why this conversation is coming about now. So Solana governance runs in a very different way than I think other networks run. Mm -hmm. A lot of networks either have no governance or they have direct token weighted governance. Right. And Solana, uh, the validators are the group that vote. Right. And they vote proportional to their stake weight. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that if a validator votes in a way you don't like, you can stake to another validator instead. Sure. Mm -hmm. And considering the Solana um, unbonding period is about two and a half to three days, it's a pretty quick operation to change sure. that around. Um, this is partially coming into effect because, uh, you know, we launched SIMD programs this year, which is basically um, like SI or EIPs and ERCs. There's now like an analogy to those programs mm -hmm. on Solana, um, which is awesome to see. The governance conversation is coming up because we have multiple validator clients. Mm. And suddenly there is ah, no right. single source of truth. Right. Like, you know, there's there, no answer to the question, what is Solana? Yeah, exactly. So Solana for the longest time was a GitHub repo, right. right? And Ethereum now is not a GitHub repo. It's several different GitHub repos that you can all run. And there has to be a process where if a chain, like the Prism team can't just YOLO a change. Right. 
right? Yeah. The lighthouse team can't just YOLO right. a change. Right. That's um, called a fork. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> right. And so uh, the governance is sort of a side effect, I think, of a lot of just that process of saying mm -hmm. we need a more formal process to accept a proposal because now the fire dancer team, the Jito team, the sauna labs team, um, the SIG team that's building an, yeah. another validator client, and then whoever comes later, the tiny dancer team building mm -hmm. light clients and state proofs. They all have to, if not agree, at least know this thing is going to happen and have right. some sort of majority agreement on it. Mm -hmm. But the true adoption, I mean, this is something that, like, I think, um, you know, I was talking with Justin Bonds about this, and he was really mm -hmm. su surprised about this initially. Solana's governance is actually fairly robust in the feature activation and adoption. Mm. So a new feature or new version of the network cannot be activated unless 80% of the stake upgrades. Mm. So we have really good implicit governance now. We don't have good explicit governance. And that's kind of where all those conversations are focused on now. Right. And so I think that in the Ethereum uh, world, the correlate would be like the all-core devs call or like the Tim Bako yeah. or like, hey, there's this EIP. Let's talk about it for like six months or something like this. Right. This is the pro the part of Solana that is like being developed now in its early stages, correct? Yeah, I would say that was um, it was it was weaker in the last two years. But like SIMD64, which was transaction receipts to start mm -hmm. being able to do state proofs and to be doing um, light client work. That was a three month, I think there's 500 comments in the GitHub mm -hmm. repo mm -hmm. about engineers going back and forth around like architecture and design for this stuff. But that really has just been built out in the last nine months. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that work beforehand was happening in Discord and Discord's very hard to follow. Right. Like moving to GitHub and moving to a full Governance in Discord's bad. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> Discord is an amazing place to solve immediate problems yeah, yes. it's a very yeah. bad place to solve long-term long problems yes. right it's too fast yes. yeah, yeah you need a slower forum for that you need right. slow lana for that exactly <laughs> uh okay awesome this has been great uh it's kind of same question that i asked um asked uh anatoly uh once a breakpoint is all said and wrapped like what's on your focus what's on your agenda yeah uh so for me one of the big things i'll be working on next is the token 2022 uh, rollout, mm -hmm. you know, ecosystem coordination. Um, we did a bunch of this work on state compression last year when that mm -hmm. rolled out, making sure there's good wallet support, making sure there's good ecosystem support. Um, we're, there's a bunch of teams working on a cool proposal for an RWA standard now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'll be working and managing a bunch of that process as well. Um, and, you know, the, the events team is going to start working on Breakpoint 2024. Yeah, when is that? Uh, so we're actually doing Singapore next year. Singapore, why Singapore? <laughs> Uh, so we've wanted to take Breakpoint to Asia for a while. Um, you have to plan really far out for right. Asia, right? Yeah. The venues book up really quickly. Yeah. And so we were looking around and we were saying like, you know, we, we were too basically too late to do it in 2023. And like the visa challenges mm -hmm. of, of shifting a whole new location were pretty high. Um, so Singapore just seems like a really great place to do it. We're doing it right after Token 2049. So a lot of the folks who are coming right. out for Token 2049, they might stay for F1 anyway. Sure. And so it's sort of, you know, you can you can crypto math it and say, well, I've already bought one plane ticket, right. so it's free to go to Breakpoint. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is some real crypto math for yeah. sure. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and when is that? What, what time September of the year? 19th to 21st. Okay. All right. Sometime around Token 2049. You know, I've actually never been to Asia. And so. Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, Singapore's great. Yeah. It's, um, Singapore's a, like a really interesting place where things like food and Ubers are super cheap and and then mm -hmm. the flights there are not. Like, so once you get there, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I think it works well for budgeting, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay, I know what I have to do to get there. Um, mm -hmm. It's a super friendly place for visas, for folks around the world. That's a big thing. We have a ton of developers mm -hmm. in India and Southeast Asia that have trouble getting visas in other sure. countries. Yeah, of course, of course. So. Uh, I know it's so far, super far out in advance, um, not totally a year out, so like 11 yeah. months, but uh, why might one be excited about um, Breakpoint 4 in Singapore? Yeah, so I think what you'll probably see is the conference is a little shorter. It's mm. two full days of programming. We've done three most years. We did four this year. It's, it's three this year, correct? We got four this year. Four this year. Oh yeah. gosh, wow. Okay, it's wild. Huh. Wait, um, it started. Yeah, it started Monday and it ends on Thursday. Yeah. So we well we go the thirty first uh -huh. through the third are full programming okay. days. Okay. So it started yesterday, which is yeah. Tuesday, and will end on Friday. Yes. Okay. Um, but, you know, we had three days of programming leading up to it right. from yeah. other groups, sure. which was awesome to yeah, see. Yeah. Uh, so for, for Breakpoint 2024, I think you're going to see a lot more of sort of um, 
what are businesses building on Solana, mm. right? Mm -hmm. a, a little bit less of a developer focused conference and a little bit more of a business focused conference mm -hmm. um, that sort of fits the vibe of Singapore. And we're supplementing that with sort of a rebuild of what hacker houses have been sure. to do a lot more developer focused hacker houses where they feel more like mini conferences. Mm -hmm. And so we're sort of, instead of trying to bring Quite frankly, the network's big enough now that we don't have to bring everyone together for one thing. Right. We can actually have multiple things. Sure. This is something the Ethereum community right. has done very well, where right. there's certain ETH fill in the blank events that are more business oriented right. and certain ones that are more technical. Right. Awesome. I've learned uh, quite a lot. So I've enjoyed my time here at Breakpoint. And thank you for guiding me about down the, uh, the corners of uh, Solana. If uh, people want to learn more or be pointed towards uh, Solana Breakpoint 4 in, in um, Singapore, where should they go? Yeah, so all of the sessions are recorded and uploaded right, sure. to YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, so the Solana YouTube channel will have every recording from Breakpoint within about two hours of the session finishing. Wow, wow, that is that is some Solana type culture right there. Yeah, yeah. we worked uh -huh. really hard on that. I uh -huh. I, I was uh, I was joking with um, our video director mm -hmm. um, that. Two days ago, I got a um, a Google alert mm -hmm. that my video from my talk at Consensus yeah is it's, finally online. Wow! Five yeah. months later, yeah, uh, uh, yeah right. so none of that, right? We think as that a these... content guy at conferences, I'm always extremely frustrated. We're like, I see you recording; yeah. it can be on the internet. Like, we have the technology; yeah, we can do this. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's like a real big thing for uh -huh. us. Is like we. We know it's expensive to get to Breakpoint. Mm -hmm. We know a lot of people don't have the budget sure. this year. We really want to make sure that the the experience of not being at Breakpoint is at least as educationally sure. valuable as we right. can make it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's the hope. Um, Breakpoint 2024, I want us to try and start selling tickets before the end of the year. Mm. So... Okay. Hold me to that internet. <laughs> the internet. Awesome. Well, Bankless Nation, this has been a little trip, a little trip down a, a Breakpoint 3 here in Amsterdam. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Appreciate you coming. Of course.